Okay, welcome to the Acid Base Equilibria 3 packet. Uh, when I get hearing the notes, I'm often reminded of an interesting occurrence that happened some time ago now. I'd uh, been teaching chemistry for about five years at JJC, and I had three very alarmed uh, pre meds come to my office. And uh, Dr. Mills, Dr. Mills, you've got to tell us about buffers. And buffers are traditionally a tricky topic in chemistry uh, 102, but how we like to think about it is not as a separate topic. And if you get this kind of idea straight, it's not so bad at all. Buffers aren't a separate thing. They're just an application of the ICE grid. Okay, so we're going to tinker with the grid a little bit and we'll see how buffers work. A buffer is essentially a solution that resists changes in pH. Okay, so we'll look at that as we go, but we need a little bit of background first. Okay, so this is all parts of, you know, additional aspects of acid base equilibrium. Uh, the next couple of pages actually really help with your um, carbonate lab. So if you're here before you finish that carbonate write up, good news, right? So I can give you a bit of extra info. All right, so salts and polyprotic acid salts. Okay, I should say really a salt of a weak acid, right? So if I mix you, for example, you know, sodium hydroxide and acetic acid, what do I make? I make sodium acetate, right? Sodium acetate is the salt of a weak acid and a strong base. There it is. Okay. Now, if I dissolve that in water, what do I make? I make the separate ions, of course. This is actually reminiscent of your... Um, carbonate lab, isn't it? Because that was also sodium carbonate, which is the salt of a weak acid. Okay, so somewhat similar there. All right. So there we go. So we have the conjugate base of a weak acid produced, if you like, by itself. All right, so that's just sitting there in solution with sodium, not H+. Plus, all right, so we've got a kind of a base by itself in solution. All right. Now, Equation one, what would you expect to happen? And again, very similar to the lab. I showed you this in the pre-lab if you want to go back and remind yourself. Okay, what would happen? Would you expect this solution to be acidic, basic, or neutral? If you remember the, the carbonate lab, it was basic, okay? So it's kind of a, a small detail for your lab because we essentially ignored it when we did titration math, okay? But it was basic to start. It started our titration at pH 10, okay? So what happens is, of course, the weak conjugate base we've just put into the water reacts a little bit with the water because it's a base, right? To make undissociated acid and OH minus. Okay, so the solution of that, sorry, the pH of that solution will be basic. Okay, probably somewhere between 7 and 10, I'd guess. Okay, so. There's our uh, second equation and there's our first equation. Okay, so two equations. The initial dissolution to make the conjugate base, if you like, by itself without any H plus in solution. And then that reacting with water to make OH minus. Okay, now this is a modified ICE because we're dealing with bases. Okay, we just put a base into solution. And I've been a little tricky here because examiners love to be tricky, right? Okay, they give you Ka for the weak acid, okay, but we have the conjugate base in solution, so what we need is Kb, okay. This equilibrium is governed by Kb because it's the conjugate base reacting, not the acid, okay. So be careful there. First, remember the golden rule, Kw equals Ka, Kb, therefore Kb equals Kw, Ka, G equals into minus 14 over 5, oh sorry, 1, 1.8, is up here? 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Now, that comes out to 5.56 times 10 to the minus 10. So be very careful there. If you're given a conjugate base from dissolving a salt of that conjugate base in solution, Kb governs that equilibrium because it's a base reacting. Okay. 
we like to kind of quote Ka values in the back of the book because it's a bit like pH, right? We talk in terms of acid, but sometimes we need to think in terms of base. So pH, pOH, Ka, Kb. All right. Now to the question itself. Pull this up. So Kb equals products over reactants. Oh, I should read the question, right? <laughs> Calculate the pH of a solution made by dissolving 10 grams of sodium carbonate. I.e. this process happens. In water, making the final volume one liter. Okay, so products. Over reactants. You could write uh, Na. C2H3O2, we can just put the anion, right? Okay, so that's true, isn't it? Okay. Which equals, and you know, I'm going to resist the temptation to draw the grid out again, okay? We understand on top it's going to be x squared, right? Now, what's on the bottom is the concentration of... Actually, I will, I will do the grid on the side over here, okay? Actually, on a separate piece of paper, I'll do the grid. Right. So... C2H3O2 minus plus H2O, boom. You know, that's our first one, so we do the grid. Yeah, as you get familiar with this, you'll uh, just knock out the, you know, the X squared on top. But uh, there it is. So I, C, E. Initially, well, we've got 10 grams, and I'm going to tell you the molecular weight is 82.0 something, right, grams per mole. So you divide that out, you get 0.122 moles and it's in one liter so it's the same strength mole per liter mole in a liter zero zero so it's looking very familiar but it's a base not a weak acid right okay so then change minus x plus x plus x weak base approximation minus x is the same number because it's the large minus the small x and x so therefore Ka, oops, <laughs> okay, did it, didn't I? Kb equals products over reactants, which is where we were. Okay, so that's where we were. So x squared over, remember what I just had? Point one, two, two. All right, so Kb, 5.56 times 10 to the minus 10 equals x squared over. 0 0.122 x which equals OH equals this times this square root of which equals we can get the number here 8.2 times 10 to the minus 6 moles per liter that's the concentration of OH minus so POH Minus log of 8.6 times 10 to the minus 6. Running out of room, apologize for that. <laughs> Let's just do that real quick. Let's get the calculator around. So, 8.6 10 to the minus 6. So I can find my log function. 5.5, okay, let's make sure you get the same thing there, let me just make sure I did that right, Eight point two, ten minus 6, log, yeah, 5.5, so pH, let's go up here, 14 minus 5.5. Should do that in my head. 8.5. So that makes sense. The pH of this solution, and you know, with rounding, you might get a slightly different number, but you got the idea there. Okay. So with uh, a base, we expect a pH greater than 7, right? It's a basic pH, a little bit over 8.5. Okay. All right, so again, 
ICE grid. Hopefully that's actually quite similar. If you remember, I gave you that extra credit homework, right? Hopefully you've done that, right? Okay, it's similar to that. Okay. Next thing, so that's uh, assault, all right? Next thing, this really helps with our lab again. So what is the difference between a monoprotic and a polyprotic acid, right? Well, mono means one, right? One what? One H plus plus formula. For example, HCl. HCl is a classic monoprotic acid, right? So poly means more, you can have di, you can have tri even. So an example of a di would be 2H plus. The classic is, of course, H2SO4, or your lab, H2CO3. Okay, carbonate. Iron minus two, two H pluses, carbonic acid, and then sulfate minus two, two H pluses, sulfuric acid. Try, there's only one real good one. Well, actually, there's a few out there. Citric acid actually is triprotic, but uh, the class of this classic is phosphoric acid. Okay. Now, we're not going to go through the math of this in great detail now. We'll, we'll actually come back to this piece here when we talk about something called half equivalence, right? So if you want to keep that phrase in your head, and this is the answer to the pre-med question, <laughs> half equivalence is how you work out the pH of a buffer, okay, which we'll talk about later. But uh, that is a titration curve for a diprotic acid. Now we're adding, we're starting a pH low here, so we're starting with the acid intact. So H2CO3, for example, is a generic, right? But this could be carbonic acid, right? You titrate it, you get that first inflection point, and then you titrate it and keep going to get that second inflection point. That looks very similar, doesn't it? But kind of upside down to what we did with our lab. In our lab, we kind of went the other way. So we started at a high pH because we started with carbonate, not carbonic acid. So we're titrating with H plus, not OH minus. So we've got the kind of the flipped upside down version, if that makes sense. Okay, and those are your two points of inflection. So, you know, let's flip that upside down. <laughs> kind of looks the same, doesn't it? Okay. All right. So that's the titration of a diprotic acid. That would be the t with a, a base, obviously. This is your lab, the titration of a di basic conjugate over here with an acid. Okay, so, you know, that's the general shape. We'll get back to the math again, you know, what these points actually mean in more detail in a little bit. Okay, now, in your lab, <laughs> you know, so obviously we didn't do this in practice, and to be honest, I mean, uh, it's one that doesn't hurt so much from not being there because, you know, as long as you understand how that pH probe measures, you know, obviously the pH as the titration goes on, it generates the curve for you. But of course, back in the day, okay, back in the day, we didn't have pH probes, okay? We actually used indicator, okay? And there's the classic right there. There's the classic phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein is used a lot because it goes from colorless to pink, right? The human eye is really good at seeing something and not something. So pink or not there is a good indicator. There are other indicators available, and there's many, many of them, okay, which change from one color to another. It's hard to see with the human eye gradual change in color. So we tend not to use them. We tend to use only really the one that's on or off, okay? But hey, let's pretend we don't have a pH probe, okay? We don't have a pH probe. Which indicators from you know the available list would be best for detecting the two, two titration endpoints in the previous titration. What endpoints would you see? Okay, so we're looking here, right? If we look, we have an endpoint at 11.9 and an endpoint at 6. So we see the endpoints from our, you know, from our more sophisticated. Uh, technique with the pH probe, we see those endpoints, right? So, you know, back in the day, what we do, we'd pick something that changes at six and something that changes at essentially 12, right? So what would be a good choice? So look down here, what changes at six? Hmm, that's done by six, right? 
and that's kind of yellow at six. Now think about what we're doing, right? We're titrating. Go back to the picture. We're titrating in a more basic direction, right? Oops, sorry, we're titrating in a more basic direction, yeah. So we want something that changes as the number gets bigger, all right? So it starts just before 12 and finishes after 12, if that makes sense. It starts just before six and it finishes after six. Hmm, have a look. Why don't you pause right now, take a look at that little list there and say, hey, which one am I gonna choose? Well, I'm gonna choose bromyl phenol blue, right? Which changes at six to eight, or it could possibly, because it's actually probably a better choice actually in that one, methyl red, right? So either of these would probably do, I think I'm erring towards methyl red as a better one, right? Because it is red below six and yellow above six. This one changes to yellow, bromyl phenol blue changes, it's, at, it's yellow right at six, so we might miss it actually, so this is the better one. All right, now, and so that goes from what? It goes from red to yellow. All right. Now, what's another good choice? Something that changes just before 12. Well, there's only really one, isn't there? <laughs> right? It's azurin yellow, right? Azurin yellow down here. Sounds very Harry Potter, right? <laughs> azurin yellow. So al is azurin yellow which goes from yellow to red. So the question says, what would we expect? Well, at the low pH range, this guy's yellow and this guy's red, right? So there's two things in the beaker at the same time. This will go to yellow, so it'll go from red to yellow. This will still be yellow when we get to pH six. So we'd see a red to yellow for M.1. Okay, and then yellow to red for end point two. So as we titrate this, it will start red. We stop when it turns yellow. Keep going, it will turn from yellow to red, stop again. Those will be those two points of inflection on the graph. Okay, so if I draw that here, okay. Red to yellow, yellow to red. Okay. Oops, sorry, there we go. Red to yellow, yellow to red. Okay, that's what we used to do back in the day. Now, if you think about it, we've seen kind of, you have to combine the two colors of the two indicators there. So for some hardcore extra credit, universal indicator paper. It changes color gradually as you go from very low to very high pH, right? So it has a multiple number of these things in it. Okay, it's kind of a closely guarded secret what they actually put in there, but you kind of figure it out, right? So if you think about it, you know, which of these would cover all the bases from pH 1 to pH 14? And we see, if you like, a distinct color of the indicator paper, hopefully matching, you know, you can make your own if you want, okay? Oh, turn it up. So, what would the color of the mixture be at certain pHs, one through 14? And which one of these would you need to do? Okay, so if you wanna type that out and send it to me, feel free. Okay, <laughs> that's kind of a tricky one. I don't really expect you to do that necessarily. It's just kind of a fun kind of thing if you're just looking for something to do. You know, how would I make my own universal indicator paper? That's the question, right? Okay. So next, so the common ion effect, all right? so. This is kind of a big deal. It comes in in many guises, so to speak. Okay, all right. So we we'll go back to that acetic acid again. Okay, so let's pretend. Okay, so we have this stuff in a container, right? So you got the acid. I'll do a generic. Okay, it could be acetic acid. It could be some other weak acid. There it is, sitting in solution. Okay, so according to Chatelier's principle, what would happen to this equilibrium if you threw some sodium acetate, for example, in there, right? So a lot more A minus was thrown in. Okay, you don't throw any more H pluses in there, just this one, okay? What's gonna to happen to that equilibrium? Well, you stress an equilibrium, 
it kind of does the opposite. It pushes back to maintain the equilibrium. So if I increase the amount of A, mi A minus, it then turns it into reactant to reduce it. Okay, so you reduce the amount of H plus, you reduce the amount of A minus by turning these products into original reactants. Okay, so it moves as we say, oh, moves to the left. to establish the equilibrium ratio as it should be. Okay, so that's called the common ion, right? So that's the concept, okay? If you have an equilibrium and you throw in something that's either exclusively on the left or right, the equilibrium will remove it, okay? It will move in the direction necessary to remove the thing you just added. Remember, equilibrium is stressed, it will remove that stress. Okay, so get that concept in your head, okay? You add a common ion is, you add a common ion, the equilibrium shifts to remove it. If you <laughs> look this up in the book, and I hate this part of the book, okay? It's unnecessarily complex. That is what the book says about it, right? The extent of, ion, the extent of ionization of a weak electrolyte, in other words, how much ions I have over here, is decreased by adding a strong electrolyte such as a salt that has a common ion. So add this, it goes that way. <laughs> Okay, so you know, don't get distracted by people with 10 cent words, okay? This is, this is really saying this, okay? You throw a common ion in, the equilibrium shifts to remove it. That's all you need to know. And that is the fundamental basis of the buffering effect, okay? Because we can remove H+, plus. makes sense, right? So remove, remove H+, plus, we'd maintain pH. Okay, all right, now here's a worked example. All right, let's go through this nice and slow together, okay? So, it's a common ion effect. It could as well be a buffer, right? It could as well be a buffer. So I think this is a practice kind of baby buffer if you want, or uh, just a common ion effect, all right? So what's the pH of a solution made by adding 0.25 moles of, so of uh, acet acetic acid to 0.75 moles of sodium acetate in enough water to make a liter? Okay, so there's our grid. They've already set it up for us, right? But let's, you know, let's do it ourselves, right? Because it's nice to practice. So we have... H C two H three O two. So we'll all set up the base equilibrium of the acid, right? And then we're going to add a common ion, which is going to be the acetate ion. So there's our equilibrium, all right? Initial change equilibrium. Okay. Initially, what's the? Well, let's get back to the question. It's going to be the same table we have there. Okay. It says. What's the pH of a solution made by adding 1.25 moles of acid? And it's in one liter, so it's the same strength, right? Normally we write zero here and zero here, right? And we can write zero for that one, but, this is the big button, right? When we have the common ion, right, we're adding some acetate from sodium acetate. If you like, that's gonna break apart completely, right? So we're gonna have 0 0.075 moles in a liter of that. So that's what's new. Okay, in a common iron problem, in a common iron problem, this initial line is not the same as it would be just for the acid dissociating. Okay, you have an exterior source initially of conjugate base, right? So just knock that on top. All right, then it's exactly the same procedure. Minus X plus X plus X. So what do we have? 0 0.125, yes, minus X, but weak acid approximation, right? X, and again here, we can do the weak acid approximation. X is tiny, so it's approximately 0 0.075. All right, nearly there. So up here, right, we can do that. And that's the true math, right? But because X is super small, it's not relevant. Okay, nearly there, right? So, therefore, great place to pause here, right? If you wanna try and just stick it in the uh, K math, you can. KA equals products. Products. Let me start that again. Ka H plus A minus over H A. Ka was given at the top. If you flip to the top of the page, one point eight times ten to the minus five equals. Normally we write x squared, but we're not because it's point zero seven five times x point zero. 
seven five times x, right? Over zero point one two five. So therefore x which equals h plus equals one point eight times ten to the minus five times point one two five and then divide by, I've got written right underneath, 0 0.075. All right, let's do that real quick. Can't seem to locate the calculator. <laughs> oh, there it is, drama over. <laughs> okay, so 1.8, times 10 to the 5 minus divided by 0.125 sorry I hope I saw that 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 times 0.125 equals divided by 0.075 equals 3.0 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter okay Therefore, pH equals minus log of H plus ion concentration. Four point five. It's acidic. All right. All right. So that's the pH of that. Essentially, what is a buffer solution? Okay. And uh, for details, we'll talk about it in a little bit. This solution will main its, maintain its pH. All right. So when we have a a weak acid in its conjugate base in solution, we can add a little bit of acid, we can add a little bit of base, and as we'll see, the pH is basically maintained. No, that's no pun intended. The pH is essentially maintained. All right, so work through that one nice and slow, make sure uh, it makes kind of sense. All right, now, my videos always have a time limit of half an hour, and we're rapidly approaching that. Okay, so in the next video, I'll start off by going through this question, okay? But what I want you to do is try it yourself, okay? Try this before you look at the next video. The answers are there, okay? This is, this is a common ion effect, okay? So we're, let's just set up the equilibrium. It's HF in equilibrium with H plus and F minus. But we're adding in some HCl, and HCl is a source of H plus because HCl is a strong electrolyte, right? So on the side, we can write one single arrow. So this is the thing that's going to go up, right? Okay, so you can have initial change equilibrium. The initial condition, this will not be zero. Okay, so there's your little clue. Get started on that. I have 55 seconds to stop, so I'm going to stop. All right. See you in a little bit.